a regular NSC secure video conference call on July 18th, I heard a staff person from the Office of Management and Budget say that there was a hold on security assistance to Ukraine, but could not say why. Toward the end of an otherwise normal meeting, a voice on the call, the person was off screen, said that she was from OMB and her boss had instructed her not to approve any additional spending on security assistance for Ukraine until further notice. I and others sat in astonishment. Ukrainians were fighting Russians and counted on not only the training and weapons, but also the assurance of US support. All that the OMB staff person said was that the directive had come from the president to the chief of staff to OMB. In an instant, I realized that one of the key pillars of our strong support for Ukraine was threatened. The irregular policy channel was running contrary to the goals of long-standing U.S. policy. Last Friday, a member of my staff told me of events that occurred on July 26th. While Ambassador Volker and, I, Volker and I visited the front, this member of my staff accompanied Ambassador Sondland. Ambassador Sondland met with Mr. Yerbach. Following that meeting, in the presence of my staff, at a restaurant, Ambassador Sondland called President Trump and told him of his meetings in Kyiv. The member of my staff could hear President Trump on the phone asking Ambassador Sondland about the investigations. Ambassador Sondland told President Trump the Ukrainians were ready to move forward. Following the call with President Trump, the member of my staff asked Ambassador Sondland what President Trump thought about Ukraine. Ambassador Sondland responded that President Trump cares more about the investigations of Biden, which Giuliani was pressing for. At the time I gave my deposition on October 22nd, I was not aware of this information. I'm including it here for completeness. How is it important to American national security that we provide for a robust defense of Ukraine's sovereignty? Mr. Chairman, as, as my colleague, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary George Kent, described, we have a national security policy, a national defense policy that identifies Russia and China um, as adversaries. The Russians are violating all of the rules, treaties, understandings that they committed to that actually kept the peace in Europe for nearly 70 years until they invaded Ukraine in 2014, they had abided by sovereignty of, of, sovereignty of nations, of, of inviolability of borders. That rule of law, that order that kept the peace in Europe and allowed for prosperity as well as peace in Europe was violated by the Russians. And if we don't push back on that, on those violations, then that will continue. And that, Mr. Chairman, um, affects us. It's, it, it affects the world that we live in, that our children will grow up in, and our grandchildren. This affects the kind of world that we want to, to see abroad. So that affects our national interest very directly. Ukraine is on the front line of that, of that conflict. Let's go back a little bit in time to when you first learned about this conditionality. And on September 1st, so a little more than a week before that text we just read, you sent another text to Ambassadors Sondland and Volker, which should be also be on the screen in front of you. And if you could read what you wrote to them. Are we now saying that security assistance and White House meeting are conditioned on investigations? And Ambassador Sondland responded, call me. You now, did. What information had you learned that prompted you to write this text message? I had learned that uh, in Warsaw, um, after the meeting Vice President Pence had with President Zelensky, uh, Ambassador Sondland had had meetings there and had described uh, to Mr. Yermak, the assistant to President Zelensky, um, that the security assistance was also held uh, pending announcement uh, by 
President Zelensky in public of these investigations. Before that, I had only understood uh, from Ambassador Sondland that the White House meeting was conditioned. And at this time, after I heard of, uh, of this conversation, uh, it struck me, it was clear to me that security assistance was also being held. You said previously that you were alarmed to learn this. Why were you alarmed? It's one thing to try to leverage a meeting in the White House. It's another thing, I thought, um, to leverage security assistance, security assistance to a country at war, um, dependent on both the security assistance and the demonstration of support. It was, it was much more alarming. The, the, the White House meeting was one thing, security assistance was much more alarming move to the third excerpt that I mentioned related to Vice President Biden. <clears throat> and it says, the other thing, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, this is President Trump speaking, that Biden stopped the prosecution and a lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the Attorney General would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution. So if you can look into it, it sounds horrible. Now, at the time of this call, Vice President Biden was the front runner for the Democratic nomination in the 2020 election. And Mr. Krent, are you familiar, as you indicate in your opening statement, about these allegations related to Vice President Biden? I am. And to your knowledge, is there any factual basis to support those allegations? None whatsoever. Um, when Vice President Biden acted in Ukraine, did he act in accordance with official U.S. policy? He did. Now, at this time, Vice President Biden was taking a specific interest in Ukraine, wasn't he? He was. And could you tell us about that? I believe uh, while he was vice president, he made a total of six visits to Ukraine. One may have been during the old regime, Yanukovych, and that would make five visits after the Revolution of Dignity, which started February of 2014. Okay. And you were the, the DCM, the Deputy Chief of Mission at this time, at the time, correct? Uh, starting in 2015, yes. Okay. And did Vice President Biden come when you were when you were at post? He did not. I came back for Ukrainian language training, and so I missed several uh, okay. visits. Now, you've seen Vice President Biden's, um, his, he's sort of given a, um, a, a speech, and he's, uh, you know, a little folksy about how he went into Ukraine, and he told uh, the Ukrainians that if they don't fire the prosecutor, they're going to lose their $1 billion in loan guarantees. You've seen that, correct? I have. I think it was a speech at the Council of Foreign Relations in January 2018. Right. And he also said that he's been there, you know, to Ukraine 13 times. Do you know if that's accurate? To the best of my knowledge, when he was vice president, he made six visits. And did uh, the State Department ever express any concerns to the vice president's office that the vice president's role at the time in, in engaging on Ukraine presented any issues? No, the vice president's role was critically important. It was top cover to help us pursue our policy agenda. Okay, but given Hunter Biden's role in Burisma's board of directors, at some point you testified in your deposition that you expressed some concern to the vice president's office. Is that correct? That is correct. And what did they do about that concern that you expressed? Uh, I have no idea. I reported my concern to the office of the vice president. Okay, and that was the end of it and that nobody... I, sir, I, you would have to ask people who worked in the office of the vice president okay. uh, during 2015. But after you expressed the concern of a, a perceived conflict of interest at the least, um, the vice president's engagement in Ukraine didn't decrease, did it? Correct, because the vice president was promoting U.S. policy objectives in Ukraine. And Hunter Biden's role on the board of Burisma didn't cease, did it? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it didn't, and my concern was that there was uh, the possibility of a perception of a conflict of interest. Ambassador Taylor, uh, the gentleman asked uh, if you could be wrong. Were you wrong when you said you had a clear understanding that President Zelensky had to commit to an investigation of Biden's before the aid got released, and the aid got released and he didn't commit to an investigation? Mr. I was not wrong about what I told you, which is what I heard. That's all I've said. I've told you what I heard. And that's the point. What you that's heard did not happen. It didn't happen. 
You had three meetings with the guy. He could have told you. He didn't announce he was going to do an investigation before the aid happened. It's not just could it have been wrong. The fact is it was wrong because it didn't happen. The whole point was you had a clear understanding that aid will not get released unless there's a commitment. Not maybe, not I think the aid might happen and it's my hunch it's going to get released. You use clear language, clear understanding and commitment. And those two things didn't happen. So you had to be wrong. Ms. Jordan, the other thing that went on when that when that assistance was on hold is we shook the confidence of a, of a close partner in our reliability. And that... That's not what this proceeding's about, the Ambassador Taylor. The gentleman Taylor. has expired. Ambassador That's Taylor. not what this whole thing started the on. The time of the gentleman has expired. Only chairmanship knows who the whistleblower is. We don't. We will never get the chance. We will never get the chance to see the whistleblower raise his right hand, swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. We'll never get that chance. More importantly, the American people won't get that chance. This anonymous so-called whistleblower with no firsthand knowledge, who's biased against the president, who worked with Joe Biden, who was the reason we're all sitting here today, will never get a chance to question that individual. Democrats are trying to impeach the president based on all that, all that, 11 and a half months before an election. We'll not get to check out his credibility, his motivations, his bias said this last week, but this is, this is a sad day. This is a sad day for this country. You think about what the Democrats have put our nation through for the last three years. Started July of 2016 when they spied on two American citizens associated with the presidential campaign and all that unfolded with the Mueller investigation after that. And when that didn't work, here we are. Based on this, based on this is a, the American people see through all this, they understand the facts support the president. They understand this process is unfair. And they see through the whole darn sham. With that, I yield back. Mr. Welch. Uh, thank you. I say to my colleague, I'd be glad to have uh, the, the person who started it all come in and testify. Uh, president Trump is welcome uh, to take a seat right there. <laughs> when you described in your text message exchanges that engaging in a, a scheme like this is, quote, crazy. Can we also agree that it's just wrong? Yes. Why is it wrong? Again, um, our holding up of security assistance that would go to a country that is fighting aggression from Russia um, for no good policy reason, no good substantive reason, no good for national security reason is wrong. Just about an hour before the two of you sat down to testify today, the president tweeted multiple times about this hearing, and he put in all caps, never Trumpers. Mr. Kent, are you a never Trumper? I am a career non-professional who serves whatever president is duly elected and carries out the foreign policies of that president in the United States, and I've done that for 27 years for three Republican presidents and two Democrat presidents. Ambassador Taylor, are you a never-Trumper? No, sir. Welcome, I think, to year four of the ongoing impeachment of President Trump. I'm sorry that you've been dragged into this. I think the sign behind me says it very well. By the whistleblower's attorney, the coup has started and impeachment will follow. But after listening for what is going on now, four hours and 21 minutes, after all of the secret hearings, after all of the leaks, after hearing witnesses such as yourselves give your opinions, it really comes down to this. One thing, one thing it comes down to. This is the transcript that the president has released of this phone call. There is one sentence, one phone call, that is what this entire impeachment pr proceeding is based upon. And I got to tell you, if your impeachment case is so weak that you have to lie and exaggerate about it to convince the American people that they need to remove this president, then you've got a problem. I want to thank you again. Just conclude by saying, because I can't let it go unanswered, some of my colleagues made the statement repeatedly that I've met with the whistleblower, that I know who the whistleblower it is. It was false the first time I said it. It was false the second through 40th time they said it. It will be false the last time they say it.